welcome to the Living the International Life podcast, where we discuss all topics from studying, working, and living abroad, and even language learning. And I'm your host, Jazz Cole, president and founder of Multilingual and Philanthropic Incorporated. Let's dive right in. Welcome, everyone, to the Living the International Life podcast, where basically we talk about international life from working, studying, or even just living abroad. Um, And I know that a lot of people have different ambitions, and I want to share as many different perspectives of what what it means to live internationally. So today we are joined by Shay Brown. She is the COO and the co founder of. The bucket list bombshells. This is also a multi million dollar business education company for the next generation of female entrepreneurs, having built a thriving community of more than 150,000 women around the world. The bucket list bombshells academy teaches foundational business skills and provides a step by step roadmap to create and run an online service based business. They also created the scale with a purpose mastermind six month group coaching program to help female entrepreneurs scale their businesses to six figures and beyond. And she's also the host of the Bucket List Bombshells Freedom Filled Life podcast. Bucket List Bombshells has been featured by Forbes, CNBC, and Great List for paving the path to remote work for millennial women through entrepreneurship. And even before the world adjusted to remote work during the COVID-19 pandemic. So thanks, Shay, so much for your time. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here with you, Jazz. I know I've had the pleasure of getting to know you over the past couple years as a female entrepreneur. So I'm excited to sit down with you and talk about what my travel lifestyle and how I was able to run my business on the road. Oh, yeah. Because like like I was just saying is that before COVID, that was just, Mm -hmm. it's kind of like you were kind of ahead of your time on that. Mm. So I'm kind of So just to kind of begin, I wanted to know like what your story behind Bucket List Bombshells is for our listeners who who aren't familiar with BB Mm -hmm. Um, and also like what kind of led you into starting it, you know. Yeah, definitely. So Bucket List Bombshells, as Jazz mentioned, is an online education company. So we've um, been around for about 10 years now. And we got started because Cassie, my best friend, and I, who are business partners, uh, met in Mexico. It's a kind of fun story. We were in Mexico, and we both had service-based businesses at the time. So she was a graphic designer, and I was doing like operations, business management, social media, kind of like a little bit of a where multi hat wearer of testing different things in the service based world. And that was pretty new at the time. And so we started traveling and we were growing and running those businesses. And as we were on the road, we were meeting a lot of women who were taking either time off or they were uh, taking a, a gap year and they were traveling, but they wanted to continue that lifestyle. So they'd always be sitting down and picking our brains. Like, how did you do this? How did you start an online business? Because at the time too, what we were seeing in a very male dominated space was uh, the digital nomads who were doing affiliate marketing or drop shipping and kind of these more masculine roles and more um, very analytical style uh, type of work. And the women that we were meeting really wanted to do something where they were more in service to others, where they were serving, doing one-on-one work, really knowing who their clients were and offering that kind of more in that creative field, writing, uh, marketing, graphic design, website design, these kind of things, right? These were like some of their background skills or things that they were interested in. And so that was really where we were doing these coffee chats. We started a free Facebook community, but we wanted to know like, how can we really help people achieve, help women specifically achieve these goals that we kept hearing them talk about in terms of starting their own online service base business and with a little bit more heart and purpose uh, behind it than just trying to make money online and make it more into a career versus the uh, freelancing style that you may have already seen. And so, yeah, we started doing that and we put it into a course format because that was kind of the new thing on the scene, the new way of disseminating information um, was through paid 
paid course content. And so that's what we started out with was our courses. And then um, Cassie and I at one decided that we reached a point where BB was becoming uh, so big that it was like our full time role. And so we went totally head it first in full time, stopped doing our service based uh, solo businesses and went into serving our Buckleless Bombshells community and audience um, through different ways. So through the courses, through private coaching, group coaching, through membership sites, um, through community, through meetups, different ways uh, that we were always um, evolving and changing as uh, the industry evolved and changed as well in terms of our product and service ladder. Um, but at the end of the day, our core offering is we help women either launch, grow, or scale. So they either fall into one of those three stages of business in the service-based or digital product areas, we help them achieve the goals that they want to have um, out of their business and their life. And finding that balance has always been really important to us. So we are big, uh, we preach a lot about being a part-time CEO or getting, making sure you have work-life balance and making sure that your work doesn't become your identity, that you're really able to separate, especially being an online entrepreneur. And if you're the face of your business, um, which happens quite frequently with digital products and um, service base, that you're able to really separate those as well. So that's really an area that we're passionate about. So um, I hope that answers your question. I feel like I got yeah. a little bit off topic there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and I'm kind of curious as to like why, um, or not necessarily why, but how um, you and your best friend were able to make it so sustainable for so long. Because I know that sometimes mm. they always say like, don't work with your friends because you're like your friends yeah. and then when like money and like, you know, things get involved. Yeah. How do you kind of make that work? I'm very curious. Yeah, I get this question frequently. People are very uh, interested. How do you work with your best friend? Because of course, um, everybody tells you, you know, don't go into business with your best friend. Don't mix like what you had said, money mm -hmm. and friendship. And what was funny was Cass and I were mixing everything. We were running a business together. We were living together. We were traveling together. We had the same friend groups. We were going to the same uh, conferences, uh, same co-working spaces, same everything. <laughs> we were inseparable, are inseparable. We, we live in separate places now, but at the time before, the pandemic and um and, and even during a bit of the pandemic we'd been you know inseparable and so i get it people are like wait how do you make it work like how does this this what is the magic what is the secret sorry and i would say i can't answer that i do not know but cass and i can i can answer it i can answer it i know it's such a lame way to say it, but there is some uh i believe some sort of divine timing and that Cass and I were put into each other's lives to be on this path together because I cannot describe to you like just how well we work and we're on the same page and we rarely have conflict or disagreements or if we do, it's just maybe our communication skills are really strong or we're just really cognizant because we're best friends. We know each other, not just on a business level in terms of like, oh, what you're bringing to the table in terms of the skills that we need in the business, but we also understand um, how each other's mind works, how each other's feelings work, how uh, we, I don't know how to explain it. She's a sister to me. So it's like a familial understanding mm -hmm. and bond. And I think that it was developed before even the business got started was through traveling, through traveling and running into obstacles, getting lost in a jungle in Thailand and being so with no, at that time we didn't have smartphones. Um, I mean, smartphones were invented. Sorry. We just, I don't, we didn't have like uh, a roaming plan. We didn't have data service, whatever it was out in this jungle. You know, you have to, you, you have to, problem solve along the way when it comes to being in a new country with a new language and a new culture and new, um, you know, navigating. Also, we used to have to print off Google Maps because we didn't have data. So we just get in a cab and there was an Uber either, get in a cab with a Google map and you don't know where this person is taking you or you get lost or different things. And you have to work together in those scenarios or, you know, there's natural disasters or there's different things that happen that bring you closer together. And I think there was a couple of moments um, before we even went into business that we knew that we were good at solving problems together. And we also bring very separate um, talents to the business and um, to our friendship as well. We view the world very differently, but then we have, um, to answer your question, really where I think it comes from was we were raised very similarly on the same 
uh, type of value system. And I think that that really is the glue that holds not only our friendship together, but our business partnership together and the way that we make decisions and move forward in our business. It's, it's always kind of from this place of shared value system. Uh, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. I know it's not exactly the perfect answer, but it's magic. It's just, I don't know, it's something ethereal that happened and we were brought into each other's lives. And I just, at the end of the day, it just works. It just works so per seamlessly, so so like a well-oiled machine. And uh, not to say that that machine doesn't break down sometimes, but it uh, it uh, works. I mean, honestly, there's no such thing as perfect answers. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Like, I mean, I guess like, in because so, in some cases I know like it just works. So uh, especially like if you both have like, like you were saying with different aspects of, you know, each other that kind of works. Because I always feel like you never, sh I, I, well, not never, but like, I feel like it helps when you're coming in with someone who's different because that way it's like, most likely they'll have what you don't have and they'll see what you don't see. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I don't know. I, I find it interesting because I've never really gone into business with a partner, so I'm always fascinated. Yeah, mm -hmm. I definitely don't take it lightly, and so, um, you know, I say proceed. It's not like I'm out here running and saying that yes, everybody should have a business partner. I don't think that, mm -hmm. but it has. It's more about being just really intentional about who you're selecting and and how they how they make decisions in their life, in their personal life and in their business life? Is it something that you admire? Is it something that you agree with? Is the way that they live their life in alignment with the way that you live your life? If you're gonna run the type of business that we run, where you're the face, you're the personal brand, you're doing life together, like there's just so many other things. I'm sure that there's also businesses that have partners that are just, that are so much more strategic in terms of like, okay, this is your role, this is what you bring to the table, this is what I bring to the table, this is it, we live our separate lives, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I definitely think, look at look at how that person makes decisions in their life outside of business, and do you approve of those decisions? Do you, th do you admire those decisions? And that will, um, I think, help you understand if that's someone that you can go into business with. Okay. And you were saying that you met Cassie when you were in Mexico? Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I, I'm interested because like when you said that you like, like, um, you know, like it was like a one way trip. Like mm -hmm. what made you think yeah. of Mexico, like of all places? Yeah, you know? no, the great, great question. Um, so I'd never been to Mexico before, but uh, the reason I went there was because a mentor of mine was living there. So some a woman had spoke at my university and we were tasked with basically writing a paper on one of, we had multiple in our entrepreneurship semester, we had multiple um, presenters come that were different businessmen and women that would talk about their business and share strategies and whatnot. And then there was an assignment in one of the classes where you had to pick one of these uh, people that have come to speak and you write a paper on them and you um, you interview them. And I can't remember exactly what the assignment was, but I chose her and I reached out to her and she was actually from, so I went to school on the island that I'm from and she was also from the island too. And so she, but she lived in Mexico. So when she first presented to my class, she presented on Skype. So that was the first time I'd have, like she Skyped in and this was like not a very common concept um, where at least not, at least I don't think it was. And so she had Skyped in from Mexico to, to do her presentation. And I thought that is so cool. She's in Mexico and she's here presenting to me in Canada. And um, she happened to be back because I reached out to her and I said, hey, I, I would love to interview you. Um, can we set up a Skype date? And she said, I'm actually in town. Why don't we grab coffee? So we grabbed coffee. I got to pick her brain. I got to get to know her. It turns out she was a website designer and she ran an online business and she most of her clients were from canada so she worked with them remotely while she lived in mexico and i thought that's so cool we i wrote my paper we parted ways and then it was about eight months after i graduated that i was looking for work and i was i decided that i wanted to get into the digital uh digital marketing space and at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity yet. It was sort of a emerging market, social media management, um, e-commerce. That's what I was looking at, retail e-commerce, because I at least had experience in retail. 
And I remember looking her up and I had, I wasn't getting a job because I didn't have experience in these areas. And so I saw that she was hiring for an internship. And so I started interning for her remotely. And then I landed a job as a social media manager at this startup. And I was doing both of those things. And as the uh, contract was ending for the, at the startup where I was a social media manager, she, I had mentioned this to her and I asked her if she was looking for anybody to do paid work for her. And she said, no, she wasn't looking to hire anyone for paid work, but she said, if you can pay your way and get to Mexico, I'll teach you how to set up an online business and, and offer online services. So it's such like a, it's so, it's so funny that that's what I am doing now. Uh, so she, she offered to do this for me and teach me and then i could come back and basically get these jobs i was trying to get in canada but i had no experience she was like well at least then she was like this will give you the experience that i was i guess needing for for my resume at the time and so then i pitched the startup company these two uh male founders that i really admired were um I pitched them to keep me on. My contract was supposed to end, but I went in and I said, I'm moving to Mexico. <laughs> I need I need a job. I'm not going to be able to get a job in Mexico. Uh, or at least I didn't think I could because I didn't speak the language. So I was like, hey, will you keep me on part time, but I'm going to work remotely. And here's how I'm going to do it. Because I Googled everything and I looked it up and I said, this is what I'm going to do. This is the softwares I'm going to use. This is how I'll, these are like the uh, meetings that we can attend on Skype. These are the reports I'll send you. These are all the deliverables. Just like I teach people now, I have basically pitched a package for them. They agreed in the room on the spot, which was like oh, a blessing, like such a blessing. They ended up being a client of mine um, for, I think, at least another two years after that, like two or three years after that. And so I go down. And so I'm in Mexico, Playa del Carmen, because the woman that I was interning now that was going to show me how to build an online website design business, essentially, was in Playa del Carmen. And so I went down with a one-way ticket. I decided that I was going to, if I could work from Mexico, then I could work wherever. And I'd I'd been wanting to travel because after I did my semester abroad. And I thought, well, I'm going to just do it. I'm just going to book a one-way ticket. I don't know if I'm going to come back. Um, the intention was, you know, possibly come back at some point, maybe after a year and settle down, get a job. And that didn't happen, obviously. Um, so I went down and I did intern for her for a bit. That, that relationship deteriorate, deteriorated quite quickly. And that was fine. Hard lesson I learned. But I learned, did learn a lot of skills from her. And I started doing my own. I looked into freelancing. So I was like, well, how do I get clients? And um, now that this, you know, relationship was no longer an option for me to continue to learn, um, I still had that one client from back Canada, but wasn't really covering much more than rent and food. And I decided I didn't want to go back and I started freelancing. So that's when freelancing websites at the time were um, also a new newer concept. And I started off and I started offering basically anything under the sun. And that's kind of how I got into more VA work and more operations management work and some website design still um, pretty much anything under the sun I was taking. And I was really good at pitching myself. And so uh, that's how that was kind of born and why it was Mexico. And then Cassie was there um, because her mom was there and I had met her mom at a dinner party. And then her mom introduced me to her at a cafe. So. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like between living like in Mexico and I know like later on you were in Bali at one point, mm-hmm. like, so like, did you go through a visa process to, for a long-term stay? Or like, like, how did that work out? Like, were you able to stay for a certain period of time? Yeah. So back then we were always on tourist visas because it was a. now I think it's a lot. Uh, things have changed in terms of working online and what visas you need and that kind of thing. But at the time, um, at Mexico, we were able to stay on a six month visa and then leave for a few days or less and come back on the tourist visa um, again because it was gray area. So it was it, since our business was my business anyways, was registered in Canada. It, it wasn't, I didn't have to have like a work visa or anything like that at the time. You know, please don't quote me on that legalities. I'm not 100% sure. This is what I did. Um, mm-hmm. And then when I, and then that's what we continue to do. Now there's actually digital nomad visas. I know that there's lots now in Europe and different countries have introduced a digital nomad 
visa. But at the time we were traveling on tourist visas. So whichever, so many times we had to do what was commonly known in the nomad industry, uh, digital nomads would do visa runs. So depending, once your visa expired, you'd go to another country for however long you had to stay out of the country and then come back into the country of origin. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I was actually just about to ask if you had noticed, like, because I know that, um, noticed that, because I know that more cities are becoming more digital nomadic, nomad friendly, mm -hmm. and especially even like structuring their cities around, um, that, like, I think like in Brazil, there was like a whole, like, I think it's like a little, a, like a mini village, but it's specifically for digital nomads. Very cool. Yeah, they were developing something like that in Bali too, right before the pandemic. I'm not sure if it ended up happening, but yes i think with um right up to the pandemic and there was such a boom in digital nomads and then i think with the rise of being able to work say remotely so no longer having to have your own business and run it remotely now a lot of corporations will let you work remotely um yes i think that a lot of countries have seen that digital nomads quote unquote or um, remote workers or people are boosting the economy especially entrepreneurs we're coming and um, we do a lot i think you know there's lots of controversy too around um you know the culture of digital nomads as well um but some of the positive things is we do come in and boost the economy especially as entrepreneurs and spending our money in their countries and living um in their countries and and um yeah i think i don't know where going with that one. But basically, I think that they're doing it. I don't know the real reason. This is just my assumption is basically, I think that they're doing it because it's seen it's a seen as a positive boost to their economy. Okay, yeah. And so was that also something that you took into consideration, like with your marketing? Because I know, like, obviously, like with the pandemic, it changed things. So I know, like, mm -hmm. Um, especially like, I don't know if throughout the pandemic, that kind of changed how you like services or what you marketed for at that point. Yeah, so with the pandemic, sorry, I'm um, sorry, can you reword the question for me? Yeah, so I was wondering, is that something that you took into considering with your marketing with bucket list bombshells? The visa situation? Um, like that, and I think the fact that like, like when I was talking about with um, a lot more places becoming digital nomad friendly. Oh, um, yeah, so that I feel like, um, we really shifted during the pandemic in terms of our marketing to remove a lot of the travel quote unquote marketing because Cass and I were no longer doing it the, as as much as we were before. We weren't um, traveling every couple of months. We weren't moving to new places um, so, so much that it just wasn't really a part of our lifestyle anymore. And we wanted to um, speak to women uh, where we're at as our business grew. So no, we haven't really incorporated, I would say, um, anything around marketing or language to promote uh, going on these visas or going to these other countries um, when it comes to starting an online business. Okay. And so even like with even like moving, like what you were saying with moving to these different countries, you mm -hmm. know, at one point, at one point in time, um, like, were there any like fear factors or anything that you kind of had to kind of like, in the think of in the thing, I can't talk in the yeah. idea of um, like, when we're talking about um, like even when I said earlier, is that like a lot of people I feel like have this fear of like, oh, I would never be able to do that because I'm afraid this is going to happen. Like, oh, my mm. mom told me that like, like I remember mm. when I first went to yeah. Mexico, my mom was like, you're going to Mexico? Like I hear like people get kidnapped <laughs> and I'm like, I'm still going to go. Yes, I heard that a lot from uh, students, parents in our community absolutely um for me no my parents i mean i found out later that yes they were you know they were nervous for me to go especially before i had met Cass and then started traveling with a buddy um when i was on my own they definitely you know later expressed fears for me but they never uh told me that at the time so they never put that on me and i think that um for me i never had the fear they my parents very much encouraged me and saw the value and the benefit of seeing and experiencing new cultures of getting of traveling of having that available to me at my lifestyle at such a young age because they're both very at when they were younger adventurous people and so i maybe because of that how i was raised i didn't have that fear i definitely ran into a lot of people that 
tried to instill that fear in me. But I feel like when I go to a country, I'm very respectful of their culture. So I don't impose my culture onto their culture. So I try my best to be mindful of maybe the way I'm dressing or the way I'm acting or I'm not, I'm using common sense as well. Like I, the same way that I, you know, people go and they go on travel, they go on vacation, they forget that they're still in the real world. Just like you wouldn't walk down a dark alley or go somewhere super sketchy, you know, here in Vancouver, Toronto, um, where it could be considered unsafe in certain areas, you wouldn't do that either in another country. So I think because mm -hmm. I knew that other people went to these countries, like tourists, I would say, I'm trying to think back to maybe where my mindset was, but I was never, never fearful. I've been in a couple moments over time where, you know, you have an intuitive, you have an intuition and you say, mm, something's off. And Cass is really good at this too. You know, something's off and you just say, no, no, I'm not going to go do that. I'm not going to go to that place or I'm not going to, uh, whatever your intuition is telling you or whatever your this gut feeling is telling you. Um, so no, I never had fear because I had a lot of, um, I don't know, I guess I just had a lot of mm -hmm. trust and I really understood that like I was in another country and I was respectful that I was in another country that was maybe not the same culture as I have in my home country. Okay, yeah. And so like, especially like even in like countries where there's like, a language that's different from you do you feel like you mm -hmm. had to kind of be like more like conscientious of like not only just like you know like learning the language but also kind mm -hmm. of navigating like how do i get out of situation getting you know get through situations where i need to interact with someone yeah know, who doesn't speak english yeah absolutely so um I will say that I have the privilege of speaking English and that English is spoken quite widely in the places that I was um, traveling to. But yes, of course, there was t lots of times I ran into language barriers and, and then you kind of find this language because if you're just there for a short amount of time no i wasn't studying the language and i've lived in mexico i've studied spanish and um when i lived in bali i did not study the language i will say um i was able to interact in english and you know there's something that i look back and you know i really wish i had um gotten to know that their language better but let's say i'm yeah there's lots of times where i've been in a country for like you know two months or so and you pick up a couple sayings here and there but most of the time there's this like unspoken language of just like eyes and hands and you body language and you just kind of i've had some of the best conversations of my life with strangers in another country, usually cab drivers or usually drivers um, or restaurants or uh, car restaurant uh, servers and owners where you're just talking with your eyes and you're saying kind of words and sounds and you're using your hands and your body language. And I've found there to be just universal kind of body languages of conversation. And it's not perfect. And I don't know if I, maybe the person that I've had these conversations with tells the story completely different. And they say, there's this like crazy blonde girl that, you know, just this way flailing her hands at me and like saying gibberish and all of this, like, who knows, he could be on a podcast or she could be on a podcast <laughs> with a completely different perspective of our conversation. And, uh, and yeah, so I think that, I think it's important if you're going to live somewhere, um, for like, you're, you're kind of settling down or you're there for more than a few months, you know, make an effort, learn the language. It's going to help you out immensely to, to know the language, to be able to speak it. You're going to, you will have a more enriching experience as well. Um, when you're able to know the language, like when I'm in Mexico, I definitely have such a more fulfilling experience when I'm able to have conversations in Spanish. It's not nearly, you know, full, robust, articulate conversations or anything, but I feel like I'm a part of the um, community that I live in because uh, I'm there so often, but I feel like a part of the community when I can speak that language. So definitely encouraging for that. And, but yes, at many times there have been lots of frustrating moments of, of language barriers. I will say like I have been frustrated to no end with myself at times, not knowing a language or a word that I'm looking for to communicate because communicating, I think is like the essence of of being a human is being able to express yourself via words. 
Okay. And it's funny that like at one point you mentioned community, because I really am curious as to how mm. you were able to kind of build community abroad. Cause I know that sometimes yeah. depending on the person, like community can kind of make or break your experience. Like when it's like, I can't mm -hmm. talk to anybody. I just stay at home all the time or like, you know, like just being able to get out and do things, you know, um, yeah. and doing it with other people. Yeah, absolutely. Cass and I experienced that, um, you know, loneliness or uh, seclusion, so to speak, from community when we were traveling, um, when we were traveling quite frequently, so we weren't staying in a place for very long. And because did be working online, uh, was very it wasn't very common um, but if you did you know you go cafe and in Mexico we met an amazing digital nomad couple that um, we met at a cafe to introduce themselves so you know there were some expat communities like ways to do that Facebook groups different things depending on the city that you were in and so Cass and I learned very quickly we need to choose cities that have digital nomad communities that have remote work communities mm -hmm. and specifically ones that centered around a co-working space that changed the game for us so that is where we made community friends there was events that were we could go to on a regular basis there was a center a hub of where we could create community even if that community was was transient um was through co-working spaces and that would that was a huge game changer for us and we would specifically then choose cities based off of co-working spaces hmm. oh that's really cool i didn't really think of that you know especially because i know like with co-working spaces i think i remember when that actually was first a thing i didn't understand it because i was at college at the time and i remember mm. I'm like, what do I need a co-working space where I just go to the library or go to the studio or, you know, something like that. But I feel like as, you know, as an adult and, you know, traveling and also even for me at this point, who's thinking about going back to school in, in Europe as well, is that, you know, it makes a lot more sense because it's like when you're an adult and you're working and you don't have like a, you know, a, an actual office space, it's like, well, there's this space and everybody kind of just comes in. So, of course, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to kind of under, um, I want to kind of talk about um, any challenges you've had, like throughout your experiences, whether it be like working and traveling abroad overall. Like, do you felt like there was anything that was very much um, of a challenge outside of like language barriers that you talked about? Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that, well, the first one, the first barrier uh, was the community aspect that we we kind of figured out how to choose places based off that that was definitely an aspect of traveling and then i think for me and why i don't have as transient of a lifestyle of course i split my time now between um, mexico and canada and, and this usa um is is that stability and that sense of for me and certain personality types that sense of routine of commute of the stableness of community of really being able to you know become a part volunteer in my community become a part of the community um have hobbies and activities that i'm doing on a regular basis maybe you're part of a club these kind of like these kind of things were starting as as i as i grew older and after the pandemic when things just became you you became more intentional i think the pandemic really was an eye opener of like what is what do i really care about in life what is the most what is most important to me and it was really the connections and as well as like personal development and personal growth aspects. And those were, those are hard to do and maintain on the road is those really deep friendships, those really deep um, connections with your family, the feeling like being a part of a community, being able to go out and, and um, just have a lot more routine and stability, I would say. And then having a home to come for me, having a home to come back to, to having a space that I own that is furnished the way I want. I know it sounds very, it sounds very superficial and trivial, but when you have been living out of other people's homes, so for example, I, Cassie and I lived out of Airbnbs um, all the way up until, you know, we settled in Vancouver, but we technically were still renting a furnished apartment. And then after that, um, when she moved back to the States, 
and I got my own place, it was like the first time that I really was able to make a space like my own and just have my creature comforts. And it's like when I go travel now, so um, when I go off for a couple weeks and like say visit Cassie or visit my friends in London or Europe or I go down to Mexico and I come back home, the feeling of coming home here where my family is, where um, my home is, where um, I just know this town and the city like the back of my hand and I'm like welcomed back, that sense i don't know how to describe like if there's a word for that mm -hmm. but that was something that now in my 30s i very much crave i very much want and it's why i did slow down and i don't travel as much i don't live a, i would i don't consider myself a digital nomad anymore i don't consider myself a transient like i'm living out of my backpack or suitcase the way that i used to um and so that was something that was for me really difficult to maintain was that sense of routine my sometimes at times my health and wellness you know you're you i get to cook for myself here i have um i just have that deeper connection to this community and my family and friends if that makes sense anyways i feel like i'm rambling now but does that answer your question in terms of like travel obstacles yeah, I, yeah I i can understand that because i think like you know like for me as someone who's still in their 20s like the other side of 20 yeah, yeah it's like you know it makes sense because like I remember like when I got to, out of college I was like I just want to leave like mm -hmm, I don't want to mm -hmm. stay I lived in the same town you know in Kentucky you know mm -hmm. my whole life so I moved to Los Angeles and then after that you know I was traveling a little bit here and there like with studying abroad visiting friends and family you know and you know, I think like usually like I feel like by the time people get into their 30s, it's like they're trying to kind of they have like an established community, which kind of makes sense because at that point it's kind of like, well, I think I want to stay here because this is my community. So I kind of mm -hmm. I kind of see where you're where you're at. <laughs> Yeah, so. that is stages of life as well. Um, I don't consider myself settled down by any means, um, mm -hmm. but I definitely have such a different perspective on my needs and my desires or not perspective, sorry, I think my needs, my desires, my wants out of life are definitely so much different than my um, 20s, which were so much fun. And my 30s are so much fun. And it's not really about the age, it's more just the season of life that I'm in. Mm -hmm. And that's where travel really shifted, the, my, my connection to travel really shifted um, as my priorities and my desires and my wants uh, shifted. Okay. Um, and so it's kind of like from my thought process, it's kind of like where it's like traveling is still something that, you know, it's, it's fun, but it's like, at that point, it's kind of like, these are kind of where I'm mostly at right now. Yeah. Is that like, yeah. To say? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of, kind of interesting. Cause it's like, you find your areas. It's like, cause for me, I've discovered like Europe is where I feel like I, is my place to be. Mm -hmm. So just because yeah. just because the majority of the languages I speak are all European based or mm. romantic based. So that's kind of where that is. But then I also realized my family lives on the east coast of the US. So for me, I know that like when as they get older, it's like, well, at some point I need to kind of like, you know, be more not set, like you said, not settled, but just more of like closer to family, especially yeah. like as my parents are aging. Yeah, absolutely. Same. I mean, that's one of the reasons I came back to uh, spend a year here. Um, you know, that's and like I'm not settled, but I have a home. Like I don't know how to describe that, but it's it's not my forever home, but it's it's because my family is here. Yeah. So I tell people all the time, like my family is the reason why I'm still in my hometown. So yeah. So, and then kind of flipping that is like, what do you feel like has been your most rewarding experience, um, a part of being abroad? Oh, um, my most rewarding experience being abroad. I think my most rewarding experience being abroad was when we traveled to Nepal um, to go to Surakhet, where there is a school there that we support. And it's actually now one of the most sustainable schools in the world, um, which was so cool. We got to be a part of that, them breaking ground and being a part of building that school, um, not physically with my hands. Um, don't worry, the structural is it's very sound. Um, but I got to be there and I got to meet the children and the women that I support, that I um, believe in, that I, that I want to take care of through 
donations and through our time as well. And so that was the most rewarding experience, getting to actually go and see what our dollar is doing to change lives of children who are coming from abusive situations that don't have access to education and they get access to education because of this um, this program called, uh, or this organization, sorry, run by Maggie, who is a fellow millennial woman. And she started this uh, school, the Coppola Valley School. And I am just so impressed by what she's done. And we became a part of it very early on. We wanted to, pretty much the first year we started business, it was important for us to have some form of giving back, have some form of supporting uh, a charity that was providing education. So educational resources to those who didn't have access to education, because obviously we're an education company, but it's also because that is something Cassie and I are so passionate about, that knowledge is power, that knowledge can help you get out of situations and this school has seen more students go on to graduate from high school and university than any other school in Nepal and there is just such an amazing magic to what Maggie is doing there and getting to go and visit and that was the most uh, time that I feel like I've ever experienced culture shock as well. I think it was the first time I'd gone to a country that really was so vastly different than anywhere else I had traveled to, gone to, and to meet those children and then the women as well in the center was just my heart is so, it makes me emotional talking about my heart is so full and there's such an incredibly rewarding experience to get to go and, and be a part of that in person. Um, so yeah, I think that was the most rewarding experience from my travels. Okay, yeah, I was like basically giving back. I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, there's a saying that like, it's like giving is, it's I forget how it goes, but it's basically where it's like, um, where being generous makes you feel better more so than it makes the other person feel better. Oh, I haven't heard that one before, but I would hope that my generosity is making them feel better than it making me feel better but I totally I get the sentiment yeah yeah so just as kind of like my final question so to say yeah. it's like how would you encourage someone who's hesitant about living abroad like you know because my audience basically is you know like maybe I I want to do this but I mean maybe I don't know like mm. um encouragement and then do you also have any advice for how did someone could prepare for that kind of move like just to I'm gonna just pack up my stuff you know yeah yeah <laughs> so someone who's hesitant to move abroad I would say that the hesitation is probably fear of the unknown like kind of what Joss had brought up like what about language what about obstacles that you've run into what if, whether it's like you know culture shock or different experiences you might face and i think that what travel has done for me and is made me grow into the person I am today. It has pushed me outside my comfort zone to make me a better leader in my business, to make me a better friend, to make me a better daughter, um, to see the way other cultures live and to have gratitude for the way that I was, I get to live. Um, that aspect or seeing other traditions that are like, so amazing and eye-opening and you think so beautiful the way that they do life and it's like changes the way that you think about doing life and and how you want to raise your kids and how you want to raise yourself and I think that that hesitation is coming from a fear of, a, of an unknown and pushing yourself outside your comfort zone and my advice would be that you will ex experience so much personal growth from doing that that you won't even be able to possibly recognize yourself on the other side and you are going to be so happy that you did because you're going to grow in such a positive way and then those fears that you're the things that you're afraid of now are going to feel so trivial once you actually go and just put one foot in front of the other because if i can do it or if the millions of tourists and the millions of expats that do it every year can so can you there are so many resources out there there are so many support systems out there and it's just about taking that first step towards the life that you want okay well thank you so much Shay. i appreciate your time yeah because so, i because i actually found bucket list bombshells when i was just graduating from college back in like 20 i want to say like 2019 was when i first cool. started I actually was like i'm just going to sign up for this course i'm just going to enroll and um that kind of for more more than anything actually inspired me to con 
to further pursue traveling abroad. It was, I don't know, I just remember getting really, really excited because it's like, okay, like there's an actual course for something where it's like, you can still work, but it's like, I can still live my life elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then seeing it like evolve into different things. So I remember showing up like for like the monthly like Q and A's. Yeah. Yeah. So, the coffee really chats. Excited. Yeah. So I'm excited to oh. see what you guys do again. I'm excited to see where your life takes you. You've grown so much. I know you've been a part of many of our, um, many of the things that we've provided in our communities. So I am just so excited that, to be on your podcast, to see you flourishing in this way and to see what comes next for your journey. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much for having me.